Hi, fourth and fifth and sixth graders. My name is teacher Victoria and I am a new teacher with Sprouts. I teach the fifth and sixth graders. So Corbin, Olivia, Curtis, Hayden, Ollie, Shane, Elliot, Ellie, and Joe all have a special place in my heart, but I'm really looking forward to meeting you fourth graders as well. I think this is the first week that we'll be back in person for Sprout. So I'm really looking forward to getting to know more of you and seeing you in person. Uh, if you ever see me around church, please feel free to stop me so that way we can say hi and chat a little bit. It really makes my day when I get to see you guys in church. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I love to bake. That's one of my biggest hobbies. And I think once everything is a little bit safer and, and hopefully COVID is over, I love to bake for you guys, even your fourth graders too, uh, because teacher Jonathan is actually my brother. So I'll make sure to save some for you guys too. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, really hoping to see you guys in person and let's get started. All right, let's now begin with a time of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this time that we had together, even though it may be virtually and online, that we still can come together to read your word and study it. God, we pray that you give us focus and understanding today as we study First Thessalonians. We pray that we may learn new things about you, about Paul, about the Thessalonians, and that it may cause us to draw closer to you and fall more in love with you each day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so let's begin by reading the passage. So we're reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. Starting with verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. Verse 7. But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God. How devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you, as a father would his own children so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Okay, so now that we've read through the passage and before we start our study, I wanna ask you guys to take some time to do your own personal study. So similar to what teacher Jonathan asked you guys last week, I'm gonna ask that you guys read the passage once or twice again on your own. And after you read the passage, summarize what you read in one to two sentences. If you can divide the passage into different sections and come up with a main idea for each section, that would be great as well. But I'm gonna add on top of to what teacher Jonathan said, and I also ask that you look at the context of this passage. Now I know that context is a big word, right? So what is context? Well, let's look at the dictionary definition. So context is a noun, and it says the circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement, or idea. So it can be fully understood and assessed. So basically what that means is it's kind of like the background for the passage. And so how do we figure out the context for this passage that we just read? 
Well, we can look at what do we know about the First Thessalonians already? What have we learned through our overview, through chapter one? Um, what kind of people were the Thessalonians before they became believers? What kind of people were they after they be became believers based on what we know about the Thessalonians already? Um, again, what did we read about them in chapter one? What was Paul's message to the Thessalonians in chapter one? And how does chapter one tie into what we just read? Now, I know that's a lot for you guys, for me to ask from you guys. And I know you may be thinking, Teacher Victoria, why? Why do I have to do this? Aren't we going to go over this anyways in the next 10 to 15 minutes? And yes, you're right, we will be. But I'm asking you this for two reasons. One, because I have faith in all of these students. Um, if there's anything that I've learned in the past few weeks interacting with all of you, it's that you guys are incredibly smart. And I know you can figure out the answers and the questions. Um, but two, and the most important one is because I don't want any of you students to just believe us teachers for what we say. I want you to know, I want you to understand, and I want you to understand and study the Bible for yourselves. So if you have questions or you're not sure about something, feel free anytime to ask us those questions. But I also want you to learn how to study the Bible on your own too. So feel free um, to pause this video and read the passage, summarize it, come up with some thoughts and think about the context of the passage. Okay, so here's the questions once more, if you wanna take a look at them. And we'll take a short 10 minute break. So feel free to pause this right now. All right, we're back. Um, so I'm sure you guys did a great job taking some notes, going through the study. And I'm really proud of you guys for taking the time to really understand what's going on. So let's go over it together now. So when I did, oh, and here's a congratulatory sticker that you did it. All right, so when I did the study on my own, one of the strongest themes that I felt was that Paul seemed to be defending himself a lot through the passage. For example, he says, our exhortation, big word, right? Exhortation means to urge strongly. Um, our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or deceit. He says, we have been approved by God. We never came with flattering speech or because of greed. We did not seek glory from men. We were gentle because we were fond of you. We worked day and night so we wouldn't be a burden to you. We behaved devoutly, uprightly, and blamelessly. So over and over, he's reminding the Thessalonians of how he, Sylvanus, and Timothy treated and acted around the, first Thess around the Thessalonians. And so let's try to understand why. Why is Paul defending himself in this way? So let's go back to chapter one in our overview of 1 Thessalonians. So in chapter one, Paul keeps on telling the Thessalonians how, um, how proud he is of them, right? And why? Because they show true evidences of saving faith. In verse three, he says they show works of faith, labors of love, and steadfastness of hope. And remember in 6 to 10 that we learned last week, the Thessalonians clearly transformed in the way that they turned away from idolatry in verse 9 and how they have placed their hope in Jesus in verse 10. They transformed so much that um, their change was made known all throughout Macedonia and Achaia too. And what's more, they try to imitate Paul's of Ace and Timothy now, right? And why is that? Because they believed in the gospel. And let's read verse five again. Because they heard the gospel in word when Paul told them the message, but they didn't just hear it. It came to them in power and in the Holy Spirit, and they believed it with conviction. So clearly the Thessalonians believe what Paul said. So you may be wondering why. Um, if Paul is so sure of their change, he knows that they turned away from idolatry and they have become true believers now. Why does he need to keep reminding them that he came with good and pure intentions? In verses 1 to 12, he's reminding them of how he cared for them, of how he didn't take anything from them. 
do you think he's worried that maybe they doubt him? And it sounds like it, right? Because let's remember, where is Paul right now? He's in jail, right? And remember, before Paul left Thessalonica, the Thessalonians saw him being persecuted. Remember when we studied in our general overview of 1 Thessalonians, we studied Acts, right? Acts chapter 17. And it says in verse 5, when it gives a little background as to how Paul was treated in Thessalonica. And so it says, um, the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. They were seeking to bring them, them referring to Paul and Silvanus, out to the people. So the Thessalonians probably saw with their own eyes Paul, Silvanus, um, they didn't be being forced out of their city. And now they probably heard that Paul is in jail too. So Paul is probably worried that they may be losing their faith in him and the message he shared, right? And let's kind of put this in context because I know sometimes it's kind of hard to read, let's say even First Thessalonians and put it into perspective as of today, right? So I'm gonna ask you guys a question. Do you guys have a favorite teacher? It could be at school, it could be at Sprouts. And why do you like him or her? Was it because they spent a lot of time with you? Uh, they tried to get to know you. Maybe they were fun and they tried to do fun things you did too. Maybe they made you feel included or welcomed and they tried to encourage you when you were going through a hard time. And hopefully you guys can have a teacher in mind right now. And you're probably certain that that teacher is the best you've ever had, right? You can say a million different reasons why you like that teacher. But let's say, what if something bad happened and that teacher was kicked out of school and other teachers and students started saying really mean things or really bad things and you think that they're untrue, um, but the people around you won't stop saying those things. And so let's say that your teacher is not only banned from school, he or she is thrown in jail too. Well, usually if someone goes to jail, usually it's because they did something wrong, right? And so even though you know that that teacher was the best you've ever had, and you believe he didn't do anything wrong, would it be harder for you to trust that person? Maybe, right? And what would you do today? Maybe you can call them or email them to see what's going on, whether it's true or not, maybe tell them about your doubts. But remember, during those days, the Thessalonians didn't have that technology to be able to, to, to call Paul or email him or see how he's doing. And so all they have are these people telling them these bad things that Paul is doing, and, he, and all they know is that he's in jail. And so that's the context of verses 1 to 12, and also one of the reasons for Paul's letter. He's checking on them, he's encouraging them, and he's reminding them of why they came and why the Thessalonians need to remain strong in their faith. Paul is reminding them that this isn't the first time Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy were mistreated. They were mistreated before in Philippi, right before they came to Thessalonica. And it was because they spoke the gospel there too, and it wasn't welcomed. But even though the people were hostile to their message in Philippi, he's reminding them of why they came because they had a message that God wanted them to share and they were going to do so because they were obedient to God's call, no matter what men thought of them or how they would be mistreated. He was reminding them of how they treated the Thessalonians too, right? He's reminding them, we took care of you. You were gentle like a mother to you and encouraging and guiding like a father. And again, why were they so eager to share that message with the Thessalonians? because they had a fond affection for the Thessalonians. They loved them and continued to care for them even after they were gone, which is why Paul's writing this letter in the first place, right? He's making sure that they're okay, letting them know that he's okay. And so again, why did Paul want to do all these things? Because in verse 12, and that's my favorite verse in this passage, Paul's hope is that the Thessalonians will walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls them into his own kingdom and glory. He's reminding them that their goal is not to please men, especially the people around them telling that their new faith is false and are persecuting them for it, but their goal is to please God alone. 
he's encouraging them that despite everything that they're going through to continue walking in a manner worthy of God. Why? Because as we'll read in chapter four, because Jesus is returning for us and them to bring us to his kingdom and for eternity. Now, isn't that the greatest encouragement of all? That no matter what we go through in this life, no matter what you students go through at home, with your families, at school, that if we are his chosen ones, if we understand why our sin put Jesus on the cross, if we accepted Jesus into our hearts as Lord and Savior, he will come to bring us home in heaven one day. I hope and pray that all of you students have that assurance. <clears throat> and if that you are unsure, you can talk to any of us teachers um, because our greatest hope for you is that you will not only know God um, or know about him, but you'll know him personally. And by knowing him, you too will want to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. Okay, so now that we've finished our study, uh, let's not only read the word, but let's also apply it with some questions. So here are a few application questions that I came up with you. Um, the first one being, how can you walk in a manner worthy of God? What does that mean? And I kind of interpret it as how can we please God through our actions and words with our families, friends, and classmates? Because ultimately that was Paul's goal as well, right? As we read in this passage, he was trying not to please men, not to please the Thessalonians, but he was doing this all because he was trying to please God. So how can we do that? How can you students do that when you're in school, when you're with your families at home? How can you please God through all those things? And then secondly, how do we know what pleases God? Um, and just to give you a little hint, how do we know what pleases anyone, right? So for example, teacher Jonathan is actually my brother. So how do I know what pleases him? Well, it's because I've spent a lot of time with him, right? I've gotten to know what he likes. I've talked to him and I've heard that he likes Legos or that he likes certain foods. And so that's how I know what, um, how to please him, right? And so it's the same way with God. Um, we have to get to know God. We have to talk to him. We have to pray to him. We have to read his word, um, especially read his word because the Bible is like his letter to us. And that's one of the best ways to get to know him. Um, so I encourage you guys to get to know God during this week. Talk to him about everything that's going on. Talk to him about your school, um, about your friends, about your family, anything that's going on. As we read in Philippians, God wants us to come to him in all prayer and all prayer and supplication. All right. So that concludes our study of First Thessalonians chapter two, verse one to twelve. But I also wanted to go over next week's memory verse. I know a lot of you guys are being really faithful and memorizing these verses, and I'm really proud of you guys for doing that. I know you guys all have a lot of homework, a lot of activities to do, but it makes us all so happy and so proud when you guys do that. So this week's memory verse is 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 21, and it says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And I know that's kind of a tongue twister a little bit, but I know you guys can do it. I have faith in you guys. But I also wanted to take it one step further as well. So when we do the memory verses, uh, my hope for you guys is that you're not only memorizing it, but you're also thinking about the words that you're memorizing. So um, for this week, I want you guys to think about who is he? Who is him? Right? It's not so clear, but try to think about it or even ask your parents, ask us teachers if you want to, and we'd be happy to help you guys out with those questions. So answer that. And then also, who knew no sin to be sin? How did he become sin? Um, why did he have to become sin? Um, and how did that make us righteous before God? Because yeah, um, he became sin. So that's a little background on that verse, and I hope you guys can memorize it, can think about it, 
Um, and we'll be really happy if you guys do so. All right, so that ends our study for this week. Again, really proud of you guys for being so faithful and watching the online videos. We really hope to see you guys in person sometime soon, but we'll continue trying to connect with you online um, until then. We miss you guys a lot, and we're thinking of you and praying for you. And we'll see you next week. Bye.